Welcome to the first of these modules on geographic information systems taught through the Center for Digital Scholarship here at the University of Notre Dame. I'm Dr. Matthew Sisk and I'll be teaching these modules for you. So this first module, what we're going to focus on is basically just what is GIS and what software we're going to be using to, to manipulate any spatial data in GIS. Now essentially GIS is computerized mapping software. So it's a suite of tools designed for managing spatial databases, capturing, storing, retrieving, analyzing, manipulating, displaying spatial data um, in some sort of computer-based system. Now that's a really complicated way to essentially say computer mapping software. Um, and to kind of break it down into how it really does it, the fundamental thing that we deal with are layers. So a GIS um, comprises a whole series of different spatial layers, each one of which is designed to model some aspect of the real world. Um, so we're basically isolating out lots of different characteristics. So like the example we see up here, this could be things like the locations of customers, the boundaries of, of particular parcels of land, um, the elevation of any given section of the landscape, um, or the, the type of land cover covering that particular area. Um, and all of these sort of combine together to model something about the real world. It could be how we route um, delivery trucks to get to particular customers. It could be erosion potential. It could be any number of different things. Um, so we have lots of different types of data that we can use. Um, and one of the most important things to keep in mind about this is in order to overlay these perfectly, we need to have them all sort of referenced in the same coordinate system. So the computer needs to be able to know where individual things are um, across the different layers. Now the system we're all used to thinking about is latitude and longitude, uh, and we'll discuss this a little bit more in later modules, but that's not the only coordinate system, and we'll actually be dealing in the demonstrations for these modules with, a, with some different coordinate systems that we'll get to a little bit later on um, in, in this, ser this series of modules. One thing I want to discuss just before we get in any further um, is, is a kind of fundamental difference in acronyms or abbreviations that comes up a lot here. Um, and this is, I just want to make very clear to you guys from, from the get-go, the difference between GIS and GPS. Um, GPS stands for Global Positioning System, um, and it's essentially a series of satellites orbiting the Earth that'll allow any device that is able to, to read the signals from these satellites to figure out exactly where it is on the surface of the planet. Um, we're all used to thinking about GPS as that way that we find out where the nearest Starbucks is in our car. Um, but in fact, it's really just the feedback between the satellites. It's the system of satellites that are up there. Um, and GIS is usually, or can often uses data from GPS receivers, um, from locational data, but is not inherently in any way linked to the GPS system. Um, to further complicate things just a little bit, that app that you use on the phone or that GPS that you have in your car is actually using a simplified version of GIS to, to route you to the locations that it's finding from the satellites. Um, so it's a complicated feedback between the two systems, um, but I want you to be very clear that there's nothing inherently GPS-y about GIS. Now I mentioned before that there's lots of different types of data that we can deal with. Um, and there's kind of two main types. Um, the two things that we deal with the most are, are geometric ways of modeling data um, and sort of cell-based imagery that we, we can use to model data. Um, and these two different data models are what we call either raster or vector data. Um, and then both of them can have any number of associated data tables um, with them as well. So when we're dealing with these, um, the real big difference between the two data models is raster data, the fundamental unit is the pixel. It's based on the pixel. If you zoom in far enough on it, you're going to see an individual discrete location of color. Um, whereas vector data, if you zoom in far enough on it, you're going to see individual points um, and then how those points might be related into different types of geometries. So again, raster data, just like a digital photograph, if we zoom in far enough on it, eventually we're going to see individual little spots of color. So just like this image of my cat up here, if we zoom in far enough, we're going to see little spots of color we can't go in any further on. Um, the difference between this in a GIS context and this in a digital photograph context is in this photo of my cat, there's nothing inherently sizey about the pixels that are in there. Um, one pixel uh, at the very, very front of the image might be a very small area, uh, might cover a very small area of the real world, whereas one very, very far away, um, way at the back of the image, might, might cover a much larger area. And, the, and this concept that we, when we talk about it in a GIS concept, context um, is what we refer to as the spatial resolution. So essentially, 
they're always the same in um, raster data in a GIS context. Um, and as we zoom in for enough, far enough, we can begin to see what that spatial resolution is. So it might be 10 meters on a side, um, so each pixel would cover 100 square meters. It might be 5 meters on a side, each pixel would cover 25 square meters. And we can see that here um, in this satellite image of, of Notre Dame campus, where as we zoom in far enough, we can see that each one of those pixels covers a, a, a distinct area in the real world, but we can still see the, the individual ones, and once we get into that, low, that, that scale, we can't see any more data within there. Now the contrast to this are the, is the vector data model, um, whereas if we zoom in far enough, we eventually see individual points um, and how they're kind of related to each other. And you can see that on the bottom part of this slide here, um, where you see the points and then they're sort of related together into these topographic lines. Now there are three different types of vector geometries. There's points, um, so zero-dimensional. There's lines, one-dimensional, and areas, um, two-dimensional. And we refer to these as points, polylines, and polygons. Now most commonly, the data tables that we have are associated with vector data like this. So you might have a point that is a location, um, and then it has a record in a table that is who lives there, what their name is, um, what their income is, things like that. Now raster and vector data can be linked. Um, vector data, by their very nature, are in some ways a schematization of the real world. Um, so what we see here is sort of we've isolated the football field um, from, from the raster image that is sort of showing the entire variation of, of what we might see from, from above. And this allows us to do things like calculate the area of that, how far away things are from it, any number of other kinds of calculations. Now vector data, again, can be three different types. We have our points. Um, in, this, in this image, we're seeing the locations of libraries um, in South Bend here. Um, it can also be lines, so, so the relation of points together into one feature that is a line, in this case, highways. Um, or it can be areas, in this case, different types of soil um, throughout, the, throughout the region here. But regardless, each feature is an entity of it to itself. Um, if it's an individual point, if it's a point feature type, um, then each, each point is, has a record in that table. Um, if it's a, a line like this, if it's a polyline feature like this, what we see is that um, there might be lots and lots of vertices, there might be lots and lots of points that make up that feature, but it's the whole line that has one record in the attribute table. Um, and the same is true for polygons. Um, if we have a very complicated polygon like this, there might be lots and lots of points that make up that polygon, um, but the, the, the record in the table itself is actually just one feature. And we'll get to these in a little bit more detail in the third module when we deal with vector data a little more directly. So I want to just stress a little bit that all vector data are some sort of schematization of the real world. So we can do things like um, represent the same feature in different ways. Um, so there might be a case where we want to represent a river as a series of points. Um, if we'd only seen the river at these particular locations, if we'd only measured the salinity or the turbidity or something at these particular locations. It might be a valid choice to represent that ge geographic feature, the St. Joseph's River, as a series of points. A little more intuitively, we might want to represent it as a line. Um, as a kind of complicated polyline tracing down through here where we begin to see um, the, the, the nature of it and we can do things like measure the distance to the river or make a pretty map out of it. Or if we wanted to get very, very complicated, we could take the same geographic feature, the St. Joseph's River, and represent it as a polygon. In this case, a very complicated polygon where we have things like dropouts um, and areas that are sort of not part of it, um, sort of surrounding by the river itself. So it's always a choice that you're making to represent a geographic feature as some sort of vector data like this. Now again, each record, each vector feature that we have has some sort of associated attribute table um, or some sort of associated attribute data. Um, as a good example of this, we have here just a map of the world. Um, so we have each country is a very complicated polygon with a series of points around the outside of, say, the U.S., um, and then the computer knows that that's fundamentally different than what's outside of it. Now, no matter how many points make up that polygon, there's one record for the U.S., um, and that's what we see in an attribute table here. Um, and there's always an attribute table associated with these, even if there's no real records in it um, or no real fields in it. So we have things like the area of the country, something that is geographic. Um, but we also have things that are not inherently spatial or geographic. So we might have the U.S., but then we also might have simply um, the, the 
the name of the country. There's nothing inherently spatial about the name of the country. There's nothing inherently spatial about the average income. Um, so we can have things that are not directly associated with a spatial location be associated with that feature itself. So a great example of this might be I could have a location, I could have a point that represents my house in space, a latitude and longitude that is my house. Um, but then that is sort of inherently spatial. And what I can do with that is I can actually tie anything demographic about me to that location, even though there's nothing inherently spatial about my name or my income or the place that I work. Um, I can tie those to a location. And that's really one of the big strengths of the attribute table that we have associated with these vector data. And before we get any further into the modules, I do want to just stress that GIS is um, a kind of complicated thing sometimes. Um, first off, I want to make sure that you guys are aware that it's not just pretty maps. Um, you're all used to doing this in, in when you ask your phone to find the nearest coffee shop, to find the nearest place to get your, your flat tire change, something like that. Um, it's just really these full GIS packages, like what we're going to be dealing with in these modules, um, have a lot of additional editing and analytical tools. Now, I also want to stress that there's not a lot in GIS that you couldn't conceptualize by more traditional means. Um, so it's not the case that it's really a conceptual revolution so much as a methodological one that GIS allows us to do. So there's very little in the GIS toolkit that we can't do by traditional means. As an example of this, I have two maps up here. One is a political map of India, um, and one is a topographic map of India. Now, if I wanted to find out what the average elevation for every state in India was, I could do this by hand. I could print both of these out. I could overlay them. I could measure a certain number of points in each, or a certain number of locations in each state, and then I could get an average elevation for that state. It would take me a really long time to do this and be pretty tedious. Um, and the real advantage of something like GIS is I can do this with the correct data in maybe five seconds. So it really is something that allows us to do a lot of things that methodologically would have been very, very difficult to do in the past. And really what this allows us to do is do things like add space to research dimensions. So we can begin to do things like address geographic significance or patterning. So does location really make a difference for a particular thing? Um, is there more of something in one area than another? We can begin to look at geographic um, correlations and relationships. So are two things spatially um, related? Um, do we tend to find more crime in areas of lower income? Do we find, tend to find more of an endangered species in a particular type of forest? Um, and we can begin to do things like look at prediction and predictive modeling. So we can begin to find out how many people might be affected by a particular outbreak of something um, or a broken um, water main. We can begin to find out um, where we're likely to find a particular um, endangered species. We can begin to make predictions about things based on the spatial data that we have, simply by combining all of these different data layers together into something that allows us to create these models. Now, the software we're going to be working with um, here is mainly what's called ESRI ArcGIS, or ESRI ArcGIS. Um, and this is, this is mostly the industry standard for GIS analysis. Um, and I'm going to get a little bit more into the specifics on this when we, when we move over to the screen capture um, demonstrations for, for the class, for the different topics that we're going to talk about in these modules. But I want to at least make you guys aware that this is not the only GIS software package out there. Um, and there are advantages to using some of the other open source ones. Um, two particular ones that tend to be very, very good are what's called Quantum GIS or QGIS, which is an open source free pa software package. Um, and GRASS, um, which is a much, much more complicated, more powerful one. There are also GIS, GIS tools available in R um, in a lot of other statistics packages as well. Um, and the main reason we're focusing on ArcGIS is it is Windows software. It's quite user-friendly, um, and it is, in a lot of ways, the industry standard. So it's the most likely one that you're going to encounter further after, after dealing with these modules.